SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952. On tonight's SoCal Connected. Many of the communities around here um, are good old boy networks. If you have an accent or your, the color of your skin isn't light enough, you're gonna get it. I didn't know how much of this was going to be blamed on me for testifying. We felt she's being uh, politically retaliated against. Don't do your old good old boy ways of, of gerrymandering districts because you might be the next target. I can go down to the block level to find out so much information about you and your neighbors from whether or not people vote in your neighborhood to things like how many toilets you have in your household and whether or not you have phone service. We can find out how many are in school. About one person works in arts, entertainment, or food services. One works in manufacturing. One works in retail. Two people work in education and health How many divorced? How many household. married? How many drive alone versus carpool or take public transit? Map makers can learn everything about you. They, along with data junkies, computer experts, and statisticians, can use data to do election grabs. Map makers and demographers use this in redistricting. They sometimes tailor make these districts to achieve a particular purpose and that's gerrymandering. And some critics say it's cheating in the name of winning. Gerrymanders draw electoral lines in order to gain political advantage. This backwards process means elected officials pick their voters instead of the other way around. It's one of the oldest games in politics. And as map maker Justin Levitt demonstrates, LA County voters have been unwitting pawns in that game. Here we can see a district that connects El Segundo with Pacific Palisades right up here. This is the kind of district that you might draw if you wanted to connect slightly more conservative areas in the north and south and avoid a very strong democratic area. This is actually the water itself. It's just like using a national park, a military base, or just a place where no one lives to connect two separate areas, avoiding anyone in between. With a few keystrokes, Levitt uses a tiny slice of the LA Harbor to connect Diamond Bar with the Pacific Palisades. He then searches for every Republican he can find, draws lines around them, and calls it a district. We've taken a county where fewer than one in five voters is Republican and created a pretty safe Republican seat or a pretty competitive Republican seat, um, even though many of these pockets of voters have very little to do with each other. He's effectively gerrymandered part of L.A. County. But this isn't just an illustration. So this is basically what I drew here is the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, fourth supervisorial district. And it was very controversial. In 2011, the supervisors drew the political borders, sidelining high minority neighborhoods like Carson. That made it harder for a Latino to be elected from the district. The legislature in Sacramento was very upset by this and ended up creating legislation to take the power of drawing these boundaries and put it in the hands of a commission. So now there's a law just for L.A. County, banning its supervisors from drawing their own lines. Los Angeles is an unexpected territory for a fight over voting rights. Many people think that when you talk about treating racial ethnic minorities poorly, you're talking about the Deep South, you're talking about Texas, you're talking about Georgia, you're talking about sort of the, the image that people have of where race relations were bad in the 60s. And California has a bunch of places that are on that list that aren't recognized as such. This is Los Angeles County with over a million Mexican Americans, the vast majority of who are citizens, and they're not immigrants, right? They are citizens of the nation. And there hadn't been a Mexican-American uh, elected to the Board of Supervisors since the late 19th century. 
The LA County Board of Supervisors was made up of five men. They were called the Five Kings. It was a very powerful board, but it was all men at that time. In 1990, Gloria Molina was one of the few Latinas in elected office. She grew up in East Los Angeles. I was going to be a political consultant. I have a tendency to be very opinionated, so I never thought I'd be a good candidate and a good politician, and never was really a quite good politician. But I was the first Latina in the California State Legislature. And so in the east side, where the guys kind of controlled everything, I went up against them, and luckily I was able to win. She was the first Latina on the Los Angeles City Council. And then she wanted to run for county supervisor, one of the most powerful elected offices in the nation. L.A. County government is far bigger than most states and far bigger than many countries. And that is an enormous amount of both power and funding. Power not easily surrendered. Molina was up against not only the five kings, but also the electoral borders that made it nearly impossible for a Latino to win. The lines were drawn in a backroom deal. The LA County Board of Supervisors drew the districts intentionally to split up the Latino population to make sure that the Latino community couldn't pose a threat to the incumbent power structure. The exploding Latino population had no real shot at winning a district. It was divide and suppress. The community was so splintered their votes were buried. So that's what gerrymandering is about. They were violating the law. They just would not accept it. And no matter how you want to interpret it, oh, we're doing a fine job, people really like us, oh, nonsense. That's not what it's about. It's about fairness, justice, and civil rights. The Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, or MALDEF, sued over the gerrymandered lines. The case was Garza, versus Los Angeles County. The Board of Supervisors, they went to town. They hired lawyers, they hired experts, they, you know, they lost at every level of the court, you know, and so they went all the way to the Supreme Court to fight this. This is my first voting rights case as a historian. And when I started looking at the documentation, started digging around and seeing the systematic exclusion of Mexican Americans through the 40s, through the 50s, through the 60s, they were protecting their old districts, right? Even though they don't say it, it's not said out loud, the reality, there was a lot of discrimination. After a three-month trial, a federal judge ruled that L.A. County had violated the Voting Rights Act and ordered the lines redrawn. It was a slam dunk case of gerrymandering, historic racial gerrymandering. Let's slice up the Mexican-American population. Let's slice up the African-American population. It was a landmark decision on par with the civil rights cases that desegregated the South. Here under the Voting Rights Act, it was clear they were discriminating against a whole block of people by denying them the opportunity to have their own representative of their choice. One of the members of the court reviewing this case noted that incumbents look at challengers from ethnic minorities with all the love and favor that a corporate board saves for a hostile takeover. After the new district lines were in place, Molina ran and won. She was one of the nation's highest ranking elected Latino officials. Gloria Molina becomes the first Mexican American in all those years, almost a century, to be a member of that board. It created a sea of change on the County Board of Supervisors. I was very unwelcome. They didn't support me. But residents of East LA did support her. She was a girl from the neighborhood, willing to fight for them. I remember cleaning the streets. Um, I don't, why couldn't I get the streets clean in, in my area? And we were assigned the worst employees. We were assigned the worst equipment. So there was constant breakdowns all of the time. Yet a lot of the other suburban communities that were representing the county had very clean streets. After Molina's election, East LA was no longer a dumping ground or an afterthought. Someone in power was now paying attention. There's decisions being made every single day about how you get to work, where work is at, what kind of work is there, what your kids are doing at school, what, you know, the quality of life in your own neighborhood. You're making decisions every single day, whether you like it or not. So isn't it best to have somebody who best represents your interest? When Molina retired in 2014, she thought the battle had been won. Maybe in L.A. County, but not in Kern. It's amazing that here we are, 
you know, 2018, and it's the same issue. It shouldn't be happening. Kern County is just a two-hour drive from downtown Los Angeles. But look around, and you might think you're in the Lone Star State rather than the Golden One. This is the land of Big Oil and Buck Owens, God and country. And decades earlier, a kind of frontier with a justice system to match. California can be very progressive in parts, but California has also had a history of treating racial and ethnic minorities poorly, sometimes very poorly. And Kern County, the Bakersfield area, has been as much a part of that history as anywhere else. A law and order culture mixed with undercurrents of white supremacy stretching all the way back to Dixie. Confederate sympathizers began settling in the Central Valley during the 1850s. There were promises of cheap land and free water. The majority of the people that came to California, especially to the Valley, agriculturalists, were agriculturists from the South, and they brought with them that Southern culture. As one observer wrote, Southerners brought more than just biscuits and gravy with them. They also brought Jim Crow. Jim Crow had a cousin, his name was Jaime, and he came west as large numbers of Mexican origin people started settling uh, after the first great wave of immigration. The Mexican migrants became the field workers, the whites, the landowners. Everyone knew their place. So if, if a group of people come in with, over time with power, they become farmers of note with political power, and they become the judges and the police officers and et cetera, et cetera. So there's this foundation of, of white supremacy, right? And you've got a situation where both on race relations and labor relations, you're going to have a racial divide that starts there early on and increases over time. Migrant workers knew the color lines were drawn and did not cross them. Oildale, Taft, a few of the other towns around uh, Kern County were built by Standard Oil. Standard Oil did not hire people of color. It was company policy, whites only. So Taft and Oildale and these other communities grew up as white-only communities. In the 1920s, Kern County had more chapters of the Ku Klux Klan than anywhere in California. Elected officials, including the police chief, were Klansmen. Those are deep wounds, and they have ramifications decades into the future. Towns here have worked hard to overcome their reputations as racist, but reputations die hard. I have a friend who was trying to get out the boat uh, near a church here in Bakersfield and was, and just because of the color of her skin, uh, she was told uh, to go, go back home, that we don't need you here. Discrimination and voter intimidation have gone hand in hand for a long time in the Central Valley. In 1952, labor leader Cesar Chavez wrote to the California Attorney General. He asked him to do something about the literacy test at the polls. The tests are gone now, replaced by potent and potentially ruthless mapping software that can keep voters in and out. A lot of memories here. In 2011, Bakersfield resident Leticia Perez decided to run for Kern County Board Supervisor. Her family has lived here for three generations. This neighborhood had always been a staple of the 5th District for as long as anybody could remember. The idea that this neighborhood, this 5th District East Side neighborhood, would be cut out of the 5th was preposterous. People brought their ballots to my parents' home right here behind you. And they wanted to know how this could be. How could it be that they can't vote for me? Her district had been gerrymandered. I think before that time, my family, friends, our support system from this neighborhood had no real clue what gerrymandering meant. But when they arrived at my parents' homes with their ballot, 
and it was clear that they could not vote for me. Uh, it was, took on a new meaning. Gerrymandering, carve out, cut out, uh, voter suppression. It meant something very real. Perez won anyway. And like Gloria Molina 22 years earlier, she made history. She was the board's first Latina supervisor and the first in all nine counties in the Central Valley. But soon, Maldef, the same group that sued L.A. County nearly 30 years ago, noticed voting lines throughout the valley were unintentionally gerrymandered. Next American Legal Defense and Education Fund says, well, wait a minute. You are either doing one of two things, or you're excluding the ability of a group, American citizens, to elect candidates of choice. Or you're carving up a political district to ensure that the incumbents, and usually white incumbents, maintain their status. Along with the Dolores Huerta Foundation, Maldef sued again, this time Kern County. The Kern County case was a big deal. It was about fair representation, or even a fair shot at fair representation, for the Latino community of, of Bakersfield and the surrounds. The Kern County Board of Supervisors, in effect, said, we like the status quo, we're going to keep the district so that four white guys and one Latino representative exists in Kern County, when in fact the Kern County demographics population was moving to 45, 46, and today over 50 percent of the population with Latinos, but we only have one Latino district, the other ones had been divided up. And they used the excuse of, oh, we're keeping the status quo because everything's fine in Kern County, uh, but it's not. And it wasn't. Before we used to just take it. There was nothing that we could do because we didn't have the money, we didn't have the expertise to handle these types of cases. Kern County resident Gary Rodriguez became a plaintiff in the case. We have been neglected for such a long time. We have encroaching dairies. We have, a lot, we have fracking that's going on. We have a toxic waste dump that is in Buttonwillow that is operating on expired permits. It's being allowed to operate in a community that has very little voting power, right, um, is a big issue. Kern farming towns of 2017 were a lot like East L.A. in 1990, on the bottom of the racial hierarchy. They were neglected, forgotten, gerrymandered. The lawsuit tried to give them a fighting chance at electing one of their own. Maldef needed a powerful witness. They needed Leticia Perez to testify against her employer, the county. When the supervisor took on the establishment to do the gerrymandering, she was going to get a lot of political heat for it. Supervisor Perez uh, took a tremendous risk, uh, you know, in uh, in participating in his lawsuit. She took the stand during the trial in December 2017. The judge ruled on the case two months later. And like Los Angeles in 1990, it was big. It's a huge earthquake. It's a political earthquake. The court said, you guys have to redraw these boundaries because you're effectively excluding one half of the Latino population from the voting rolls. Federal judge found that the history of racially polarized voting here was profound, obvious, and could not be denied. That uh, for many parts of this community, uh, our Caucasian brothers and sisters uh, really do not want uh, a Latino representative. I mean, it's really that simple. It was the first challenge to the Voting Rights Act in California in more than 15 years. Latino voters won and they did it on Cesar Chavez Day. This is a signal change for this community and one that will result, we believe, in better representation for the entire county. This is major. Uh, this is an actual sea change in Kern County. You know, it's remarkable to be uh, a minority in this country, um, you are constantly reminded, uh, you are constantly um, trying to bridge a gap between or your place. Some white dominated districts are now majority Latino. Safe seats are now competitive. It's life or death for some politicians. And a lot of that is because of Perez's testimony at trial. Intentionally or not, she hurt the county's case. I was a little bit afraid. 
Uh, I didn't know how much of this was going to be blamed on me for testifying. Tonight, an unprecedented announcement from the Kern County District Attorney. Today, the Kern County District Attorney's Office filed a two-count complaint against Kern County Supervisor Leticia Perez. In July of 2018, Perez was charged with two misdemeanors. They involved campaign reporting and conflict of interest over a vote to legalize cannabis stores in Kern. The prosecution is a first for Kern County. Other officials caught in similar situations just paid a fine to the state. Perez's lawyer is outraged. I've tried many, many criminal cases. I've never, ever seen a case like this. The stakes are high. Perez has pled not guilty. If convicted, she faces six months in jail and a temporary ban from elected office. Maldef is asking the California Attorney General to investigate the prosecution, claiming it's retaliation. I thought she's being uh, politically retaliated against, uh, you know, in Kern County. So uh, for her participation and advocacy for another Latino supervisorial district. It is really unfortunate what they're doing to Leticia, and it's regrettably, it is about power, it is about racism, and it's about not understanding justice for everyone. You have a situation where uh, this county and, and the city and many of the communities around here um, are good old boy networks. And if you have ovaries, and if you have an accent, or your color is the skin of your the color of your skin isn't too light enough, um, you're going to get it no matter what. The district attorney has denied this is political payback. Perez and the DA's office are now under a gag order and can't comment. Those are my grandsons, and they raise cattle for a living. And family is very important to us here at this company, so that's what I surround myself with. David Noer is the mayor of Taft, a small oil town outside of Bakersfield. The city has seen its share of unavowed racists over the decades. But that's the past, Noer says. When you look around the city of Taft, you don't see a lot of gang graffiti and things like that. We're a small community, and we pride ourselves on that. And I told him, within the city of Taft, my city, I can comfortably walk from one end of this city to the other any time, day or night. I believe they solved a problem that I don't believe truly existed. Latinos keep losing, not because of a rigged system, Nor says. What's the biggest effect on the outcome of that election? Was it the drawing of those map lines or was it indeed the fact that the people did not show up to vote? If only 18% of you are actually voting, how important is it then to your community? He calls what's happening in Kern reverse discrimination. Leticia Perez herself said this is a historic moment and that finally Latinos could be, would be properly represented. I did not hear her mention anybody of the electorate by way of their nationality other than Latinos. To me, I believe that's disturbing. How do you feel if you're an African American? How do you feel if you're a Caucasian? How do you feel if you're Oriental? How do you feel about that? I, I would be bothered by that. There's an election coming up. But no matter who wins, many residents here feel they've already won. Their vote matters, perhaps more than it ever has. These are American citizens that are battling, right? Um, it is David and Goliath because they, they've never had influence. They've never had power. They're the poorest of the poor. They are the sons and daughters of farm workers, if not farm workers themselves, right? And so they've never, ever experienced the jubilation of being able to say, we won this epic battle and all we want to do is vote. It's simple as that. Thank you.
Thank mm-hmm. you.